Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a poem, Beat, Beat Drums, poem number three of uh, the 43 of the drum taps uh, section. And I want to remind you that Whitman said in To the Old Cause, my book and the war are one. Now my assumption is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down the left-hand side, Talks with Walt. We've given uh, a set of lectures from everything beginning with that very first word, come, and all of the inscriptions, poems. We gave an introductory set of comments to drum taps, and, uh, and, and we just finished with 1861. Now, our Nortons will tell us about the background of this poem, that this stirring call to arms was first published simultaneously, September 28, 1861, in both Harper's Weekly and the New York Leader. And then the point is made, note the skill with which Whitman, by uh, spondaic as well as an apestic emphasis, imposes his martial rhythm. That is to say, we're going to pay attention to the construction of this poem. Now, this poem was written shortly after the first battle of Bull Run um, in uh, July of 1861. And to that degree, this is a fascinating poem for us to study. It's one of what some scholars have called the mobilization poem the, during the opening days of the Civil War. And again, we're going to see this enthusiasm that's obviously a huge part of this. Before I read this poem with you, though, I just want to remind you of the last two stanzas of Song of the Open Road. And I want to pay attention to the ways in which those lines prepare us for uh, beat beat drums. He says it this way, Alone through struggles and wars, the goal that was named cannot be countermanded. Have the past struggles succeeded? What has succeeded? Yourself, your nation, nature? Now understand me well, it's provided in the essence of things that from any fruition of success, no matter what, shall come forth something to make a, great, make a greater struggle necessary. You're, of course, familiar with that word struggle from the previous poem, 1861. My call, he says, is the call of battle. I nourish active rebellion. We're, we're obviously going to read drum taps in all of the 43 poems of drum taps through this lens because this poem comes earlier in the, in the deathbed edition. My call is the call of battle. I nourish active rebellion. He going with me must go well armed. Obviously a, a word we've already seen a number of times in these poems of drum taps. He going with me goes often with spare diet, poverty, angry enemies, and desertions. And then, of course, the 15th fast. It's along, so let's go. The road is before us. It is safe. I've tried it. My own feet have tried it well. Be not detained. Let the paper remain on the desk unwritten and the book on the shelf unopened. Let the tools remain in the workshop. Let the money remain unearned. Let the school stand. Mind not the cry of the teacher. I want you to pay attention to that mind not phraseology. Let the preacher preach in his pulpit. Let the lawyer plead in the court and the judge expound the law. And then, of course, he finishes with the famous Camaretto. I give you my hand. I give you my love more precious than money. I give you myself before preaching a law. Will you give me yourself? Will you come travel with me? Shall we stick by each other as long as we live? Now, from there, we come to this interesting poem, Beat Beat Drums. I want to point out that we've got some interesting constructions. Three stanzas of seven lines each, and the meter is going to move from dactylic to iambic to iambic and, and apestic, and as, as we heard from, from Norton's, we're going to have some experimenting that happens here. Let's go stanza by stanza. First, uh, first stanza. Beat Beat Drums. Blow, bugles, blow. Through the windows, through doors, burst like a ruthless force into the solemn church and scatter the congregation into the school where the scholar is studying. Leave not the bridegroom quiet. No happiness must he have now with his bride, nor the peaceful farmer any peace, plowing his field or gathering his grain. So fierce you whir and pound, you drums. So shrill you bugles, blow. Now let's point out, obviously, as we have said, that drum taps is a very intentional title, and of course taps is what is played by bugles. Let's also point out that we've got 14 dashes in this poem, and so we're going to emphasize the use of the dash here. Notice the prepositions right from the beginning, and we've seen this in earlier poems as well. Through the windows, through doors, and then of course the word burst. Burst like a ruthless force. If before it was terrible, now it is ruthless. And then back to prepositions. Into the solemn church scatter the congregation. Of course, think of it. Leaves of grass and the scattering of seed. We've seen this imagery already. 
into the school where the scholar is studying. You'll remember that, mind not the, the call of the teacher. And the, where the scholar is studying, leave not the bridegroom quiet. And again, in leaves of grass, any time the word leave gets used, or leaving, we've pointed out the significance of the use of that word, right? Leave not the bridegroom quiet. No happiness must he have now with his bride. Notice that last sentence of the previous poem and the word sad here. No quietness, no, or I'm sorry, no happiness must he have now with his bride. Nor the peaceful farmer any peace plowing his field or gathering his grain. And I think it makes sense for us to remember that before the greatest war that Whitman would ever, ever be able to talk about, the, the war at Troy, he knows his Homer. He knows that Odysseus tried to stay out of that war by pretending to be uh, mad plowing his fields. And there's a whole backstory, of course, of Odysseus not really wanting to go to Troy, as, of course, Achilles as well, because they kind of know what, how it's going to just change everything about their life. And I think there's some of that here with the peaceful farmer. So fierce, and obviously that's going to be a significant word in drum taps, right? Fierce, you were and pound you drums. The onomatopoeia obviously is being played with the word were. So shrill, you bugles blow. And again, this L sounding that gives this kind of almost like tripping, marching uh, cadence. The second one will begin with the same beat beat drums again. Beat beat drums blow, bugles blow. Over the traffic of cities, over the rumble of wheels in the streets, are beds prepared for sleepers at night in the houses. No sleepers must sleep in those beds. No bargainers, bargains by day. No brokers or speculators would they continue. Would the talkers be talking? Would the singer attempt to sing? Would the lawyer rise in the court to state his case before the judge? Then rattle quicker, heavier drums, you bugles, wilder blow. Notice again, we're back now from the farms to the city. We've seen this movement from the, um, from the um, you know, rural to the urbane, over the traffic of cities, over the rumble of wheels and streets. And then a series of five questions that are obviously rhetorical. Are the beds prepared for sleepers at night in the houses? Of course, we'll think about the fact that sleepers is one of the leaves of grass greatest poems. No sleepers must sleep in those beds. No bargainers bargain by day. In other words, everything's going to change. This, this no sleeping takes us back to, of course, what Macbeth argues. He hears when he's killing Duncan, Macbeth shall sleep no more. Macbeth has murdered sleep, right? That thing of Caldor has murdered sleep. We're playing the same game. In other words, what are we saying? All of life is about to be disrupted. The economy of a nation is going to be disrupted. No brokers or speculators would they continue? Now, obviously, there's a bit of irony here because somebody made some money and always makes money during wartime, right? It obviously is a certain kind of defense community or, or militaristic community that, that invents all of these technologies and makes all of these technologies. No, um, um, uh, no bargainers bargains by day. No brokers or speculators. Would they continue? Would the talkers be talking? Would the singer attempt to sing? Interesting given that the use of the word sing all the way through leaves of grass. Obviously, I hear America singing. Would the lawyer rise in the court to state his case before the judge? The question about law and legalities. Um, then rattle quicker. It's a fascinating use of the word. Rattle quicker, heavier drums, you bugles, wilder blow. We go from fierce to wild. And then finally, the last, um, the last stanza. Beat, beat, drums, blow, bugles, blow. Make no parley. Stop for no... Um, and, and then it's, it's interesting. Expostulation is this word. In other words, there's no talk that can stop what's about to happen. And then, sounding very much like Song of the Open Road, mind not the timid, mind not the weeper or prayer, mind not the old man beseeching the young man. Notice with this uh, idea of timid, we're back to the ideas of soft and dainty from earlier. Um, let not the child's voice be heard. Note the irony of this, if you've read this collection of poems from the very beginning, because children have factored so heavily, and of course, a child came to me fetching the grass asking, what is it? Song of Myself 6. So much of that child's voice is now going to be silenced. Not heard, right? Don't let it be heard. Nor the mother's entreaties. Think about all of the references to mothers in Leaves of Grass. Make even the trestles to shake the dead where they lie awaiting the hearses. So strong you thump. Only use in all Leaves of Grass this word. Oh, Terrible, we're back to that word again, drums. So loud, you bugles, 
blow. It's, it's interesting that a lot of uh, readers have pointed out that there's no exclamation point at the end of this poem with the word blow, and maybe there should be. Well, what is the major message here? Well, obviously, that tragically, war will reach out and touch all people. There isn't going to be anybody, Whitman is going to argue, that will go unscathed from this entire experience. And note the way you can read this at 2B as being either direct or ironic, right? We're not going to listen to anyone that's going to try and say, are we really sure this is what we want to do? Plunge the nation into war in this way. For Whitman himself, he would vacillate between believing this was necessary to believing this was anything but necessary, back and forth. Of course, at 2B, the three stanzas of seven lines each, of course the meter as we've said, and the varying line lengths as well. At 3A, I would just throw at you Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade, the 1854 poem. Think about your dates there. 1854 poem, and now writing as 1861. That is to say, in America, people like Whitman already knew some of the horrors, and of course Whitman's appreciation and sometimes mm, unappreciation of Tennyson. But I've given a full lecture on this at LearnStrong.net. You can go and take a look at Charge of the Light Brigade if you're unfamiliar with that text. Finally, at 3B, to own a poem like this, I'll ask you, in your life, when was a time that you tried to talk someone out of a negative action and they just refused to listen in the same way that is being suggested here? And then finally, and this is again, one of the reasons I think that this collection of the 43 poems of drum types has to be read today. Why do you think people get so excited and forget to listen or to talk to each other right before the time of serious conflict and war. What is that? Why is it the case that we stop listening to each other and we just start getting ready to go to war? It's a sad reality. Thank you.